just you know what I'm saying here whoop ass and you know what I'm saying stand in the top top category Nate Diaz is the unlikeliest superstar in UFC history to achieve notoriety in the world of combat sports and beyond you need charisma favorable circumstances support of the corporate machinery and most importantly some degree of dominance I, I do learn a little from every every fight uh, I try to take tr take stuff from each fight win or lose you know even when you win you're not you didn't do everything completely correct Brock Lesnar Conor McGregor and Ronda Rousey are some of the most popular stars in MMA history and in addition to charisma and beneficial circumstances these athletes had the blessings of Dana White himself Nate Diaz on the other hand had almost none of those and yet he walks away from the octagon as one of the biggest superstars in recent memory in spite of the fact that his own boss was out to get him how did this happen well karma is something to behold Nate Diaz entered the sport while following the footsteps of his older brother. It's great to have Nick. Nick's the best fighter in the world, so as far as I'm concerned, pound for pound, that's the best fighter there is. So I don't care, you know. His first professional fight took place in 2004, and within a few short years, Nate Diaz was on the Ultimate Fighter. He won the fifth season and made UFC his own for the next 15 years of his professional life. I love everything about fighting. I think it's great. I can't get enough of it. He fought often during the formative years of his UFC career and always put on an entertaining show. But as time went on, his relationship with the UFC brass began to deteriorate. Aside from monetary disputes, Nate Diaz spoke his mind and did whatever he wanted to do. And this did not sit well with Dana White. All of a sudden this punk, punk guy is coming on and slick back hair, a little puny virgin nose. And it's like, punk gets uh, fighting the UFC. I don't, I don't, I don't dig it. Suddenly, Nate Diaz was fighting once a year and reports indicated that he was close to calling it a career amid tensions with the UFC. But in early 2016, a lightweight championship fight fell through and Conor McGregor was without an opponent. Yeah, Conor McGregor, you're taking everything I work for, mother I'm gonna fight your You know what's the real fight, what's the real money fight is me. The UFC then approached Nate Diaz and offered him a shot at the seemingly invincible Conor McGregor on two weeks notice. All right, Dana, uh, the show will go on. So who is McGregor going to fight? He will fight Nate Diaz. Uh, you know, we, we figured that this would be the most exciting fight. McGregor, the mythical fighter, opened up as a big favorite over the disgruntled and inconsistent Nate Diaz. This was a small bump on the road. The UFC was looking to make the most out of it by sacrificing a cult hero to Conor McGregor before he moved on to attaining double champion status. A couple other guys that maybe might be able to get in. Nate for me was, was the leading option. There were many, many options, but let's see what this man is about. He talked like I took something from him. That's what he said after the fight. And then everyone else went running. So Nate, congratulations. The odds were stacked against Diaz, but the Stockton native rose to the occasion and strangled the mystique of McGregor in the second round of the fight. And consequently, he became a superstar himself. They're the new king of this now and it's right here, all right? You can never have enough stars in a company. But for the UFC, this was an unmitigated disaster. The second superstar in the company was the same guy they had tried to set up for a massacre. Nate, where do you go from here? What, what would you like to do next? I'm at the top, so it's their call what's next. We'll see what happens. Unfortunately, the frequency of his fights got even worse. After the rematch with McGregor, Nate disappeared for three years. And the backstage war between him and Dana White continued. His return fight was against Anthony Pettis, but beyond that, he was put up against Masvidal, a welterweight contender on the cusp of superstardom. After that, he was booked against Leon Edwards, a welterweight contender in some desperate needs of exposure. I feel like I'm in a position to be able to pick and choose, because I've already done more than all these fighters, you know? So that's my thoughts on that. It's cool. The intention behind these mismatches was transparent. Diaz was set up as a sacrificial lamb to those who needed an extra boost in popularity. But in both matches, Diaz walked away as the people's champion and an unlucky fellow, and not as the loser the UFC had hoped. The fight against Masvidal was cut short due to a cut, and he clowned the future welterweight champion Leon Edwards in the closing moments of their fight. The narrative was painted by Nate Diaz, and his popularity despite two losses remained intact. He still had that swagger going on. I want to say thanks to everybody for the love and support. In 2022, Nate Diaz had one more fight left on his contract, and he was looking to brawl with someone like Dustin Poirier, a 
perennial lightweight much like himself, and then right off into the sunset. Dana White, however, had something else in mind. An undefeated phenom by the name of Hamza Chemaev needed to feast on a popular name, and that was the match. UFC 279 was to be headlined by Hamzat, an occasional middleweight versus Nate Diaz, a career lightweight. The contractual snags had led up to this, a checkmate in favor of the company. This was how his UFC career was supposed to end, mauled by a wolf and beaten out of the company. Dana White had defended the horrid matchmaking by saying that Diaz himself wanted to fight Hamzat, but during fight week, the Stockton native himself rubbished the claim. But this was his last contractual fight, and he wanted to get it over with. What they got me doing right now is they're acting like I called for this fight, which I don't, didn't call for, and I don't want, and didn't want, and still don't want, but I don't give a fuck go fight anybody. Constant stalling by the UFC drove Diaz to this, and Dana White was a very happy man. He finally got him where he wanted, locked up in a cage against a phenom who was perfectly capable of crushing the legend of Nate Diaz. Damn them fuck everybody if i get my ass whooped guess what whatever but life works in mysterious ways people and often with a tendency of rectifying justice to those who never received it i don't think you've heard anybody say it and nate diaz best just beat jamaya you want to deny that karma struck the company once more and just a day before the event the superstar in making, the chosen one, Hamza Chemaev missed weight by close to 8 pounds for the most important fight of his career. Scale right now. 178 and a half. Oh. oh my God. It's 8 pounds. A day before this, he played a part in the cancellation of the pre-fight press conference. And with the miss, he sunk the entire event into chaos. One day before the biggest fight of his life, Hamza undid the months of planning carried out by Dana White and the tide shifted once more. Nate Diaz was the one in control, and the event hinged upon his decision. He was well in the right to say no to the company that had attempted to sabotage him, but he picked his own opponent, a fellow legend in Tony Ferguson. Khabib's bitch ass was afraid of him, just like this bitch ass motherfucker was afraid of me yesterday. And he remained the main event, while the corporate favorite was relegated to the co-main. This was supposed to be a sacrifice, but greed begets karma. And UFC 279 concluded as the last triumph of Nate Diaz as he walked away from the octagon with a victory over a guy he respected in Tony Ferguson. AJ ain't nothing but a number. I'm younger than my whole gym. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I'm the most likely kid in the gym, and I'm the most likely kid when it comes to uh, participating in races and competing. And Meanwhile, Hamzat picked up a dominant victory over Kevin Holland but he is no closer to a welterweight title shot, and his reputation will never be the same. What did you make of his performance? Lame, scared, boring, rookie, whack, pussy, lame, dick sucker. The victim in this fiasco left with a victory, a truckload of extra cash. So how much more did they give you? I lost count. And a whole lot of bragging rights over his own employer. For the UFC, Nate Diaz was karma incarnate from start to finish. In his post-fight interview, Diaz mentioned that he would eventually return to the octagon, but this is likely the end of the Nate Diaz show. He was never a champion. He was never the best fighter in the division, and he was never on the pound-for-pound -pound list. But in addition to being a massive fan favorite and superstar, Diaz will be remembered for what he always preached, a gangster. There is nothing more gangster than flipping your boss off on the final day of employment. And Nate Diaz, despite all the roadblocks put in his career, did just that.